Hello everybody, I'm your host Abid Samhuri, the lead of Axon Cyber Institute. This is episode number six of the Navigating the Cyberland series, coming to you on the second Thursday of every month, where we dive deep with hands-on demos into a certain topic in the field of cybersecurity. This session is recorded and you can replay it later on on demand, and you can also access previous episodes on demand by going to the URL app.livestorm.co slash axon dash technologies. The topic of today's session is going to be OAuth 2.0 security attacks and countermeasures. Hello, everybody. It seems there was a problem with the uh, microphone. I hope everybody now can hear me. I'm your host, Abed Samhuri, the lead of Axon Cyber Institute. This is episode number six of the Navigating the Cyberland series coming to you on the second Thursday of every month, where we dive deep with hands-on demos into a certain topic in the field of cybersecurity. This session is recorded and you can replay it later on on demand. You can also access previous episodes on demand by going to the URL app.lifestorm.co slash axon technologies, which is the URL that was on the home page over here. You can find all the previous um, webinars recorded and you can play it on demand. Before I start, I would like to say that this webinar contains hands-on demos and labs, and I highly encourage you to follow me with this lab. In doing so, you can go to the portswigger.net website and register an account right now, and you can go to the OAuth authentication section of their academy, and you can find the list of all labs. In order to perform the labs, you will need the Purpose Suite tool or the Zap Proxy tool. I'm going to use Zap Proxy for the sake of today's demonstration. Or if you have Kali Linux, it comes already with both of these tools. We're going to do three labs. They have like a bunch of maybe 10 labs on OWAT authentication. We will not have the time to do them all. However, we're going to do three of them. The first one is going to be authentication bypass via via. OAuth implicit flow, and then the second, the fourth OAuth uh, profile linking, and the third one is stealing OAuth access tokens via a proxy page. So the agenda is going to be like follows on today's webinar. I will start with giving an intro to OAuth framework, why it was invented, what problem does it solve, and then we're going to uh, dive deeper into the different implementations of OAuth. There are different Im implementations. Some of them, one is simpler, one is more complicated and complex, yet it provides additional security. And we will talk about these types of implementation. One of them is called the implicit uh, grant type, and the second is called the authorization code a grant type. We will explain them in details, and then we will look at four vulnerabilities that might exist in OAuth implementation, whether on the client side or the server side. I have to say that if OAuth authentication, if OAuth framework is properly implemented, 
it should be secure from vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities are not inherent to how, how OAuth itself is, but rather they are misconfigurations due to lack of knowledge from the developer. So some of these vulnerabilities exist on the client side, others exist on the server side. We will look at two on the client side and two on the server side, and we will do three labs on these vulnerabilities. So let us start with the, the, the reason why OAuth was invented in the first place. OAuth stands for Open Authorization, and it was meant as an authorization framework, not as authentication framework, even though it can be used as authentication. So mainly it was for authorization purpose. Now, back in the days, let us imagine you have an account on some some large website, something like uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or Google, or like in the old days, we have got MySpace, for example. So you have uh, you have you have an account on such a website with the credentials, and you have some data that is stored in your account on their website. And on the diagram here, that website would be the one on the on your right side here, the website with user data. Now the problem is come the problem comes here is when you try to navigate or browse a third party website and that third party website would like to access a portion of your data that exists on the first website. So let's say this is like some online website that would like to access your contacts from your Google account. In the old days before OAuth was developed and invented the third party website this website is going to ask you for your google credentials so it's going to ask you it will tell you hey please give me your username and password on that website on google.com and then the user would reveal their credential trusting that this th third web third party website is secure and they're not going to use it for illegitimate purpose and nobody is going to hack into that website and compromise the passwords and then once the third party website has the credentials they log in to the first website and pull out the the data that is requested which is your contact list for example so now it's very obvious why this is insecure model. Uh, your credential is being revealed to a third party. This is something totally insecure against best practices in cybersecurity. Additionally, if even if this website, for example, is a trustworthy, who knows what happens when a hacker manages to attack or hacks into this website? So they compromise, they get, they compromise all uh, credentials or usernames and passwords for tons of people who already registered with the first website. So this is was the old days. So it was invented to solve this problem in the first place. Let us look how uh, OAuth solves this problem. How how does it function? How is it implemented? We will look at two scenarios of implementation. The first one is called the implicit grant type, which is the simpler one. And then the second one is called authorization code grant type, which is the more complex and supposedly the more secure. So let us start with the implicit grant type. Now in the implicit grant type, again, we have, this is the one on the right is supposedly like uh, the OAuth provider. This is like google.com, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, any of these social media websites. And then the client application is the third party application who would like to access some portion of your data that exists on the OAuth provider. So you, 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 or, or, or in case of authentication, the client application instead of storing credentials for the user at its own database would like to authenticate users based on their authentication to the OAuth provider. This is another uh, functionality of, uh, of OAuth. So whenever the client application now would like to, to authenticate or would like to access that portion of data on the OAuth provider, it's gonna send the first step, is gonna send something we call authorization request. 
okay and the authorization request will be sent from the client application this is the client application over here which is actually a server however in the OAuth model it is a client because the OAuth provider is the server the authorization request does is not sent directly to the OAuth provider it has to be sent via the browser so if you are browsing for example uh, the, the client application and then it says uh, log in using Google uh, using Google account you will see on the on, on the network trace on the network analyzer you will see that the authorization request comes from the application the client application and then it is redirected from your browser to the OS provider so it is always mediated by the browser so it goes from the client application all the way to the OAuth provider and it looks like the following so it is sent as a get request from the browser to the OAuth provider and it goes to a particular uh, endpoint or a particular um, API or a particular folder you can say or a file and in this case is authorization and each OAuth provider has its own standard and name convention. So whenever a client application would like to utilize OAuth on a certain provider, it has to know which API it has to contact for the initial authorization request. So it has to be, this is something that is documented beforehand and the client application has to know the documentation and the API calls beforehand. Not only that, it has to even register itself and we will talk about that in a while so it's gonna send to to a particular authorization api and then in this case slash authorization sometimes it could be slash auth only and then it's gonna send a bunch of parameters so those these are important parameters the first one is the client id this is the identification of the client application over here so it lets the auth provider know who is sending the authorization request, okay? And then it appends another parameter and we call this the redirect URI. Somebody is asking about the token. I'm coming to the token in a while. So the client ID is the ID of the client, the redirect URI. This is the, the API endpoint uh, to which the response will be sent to. So it's telling the OAuth provider that the response to my authorization request has to be sent to that redirect URI. And this is what we call the callback endpoint. So usually it is a callback over here on the client application. The OAuth has to redirect now the response to the callback, providing whatever necessary information that is requested. We have, um, I highly encourage you to take notes and you have your pen and paper and write these down because we will come to them later on and we will see how they can be compromised, how misconfiguration in the redirect URI, for example, or the state can actually open the door for vulnerabilities. So after the re redirect URI, we have the response type. This indicates what type of flow this is going to happen. The type of flow since it is implicit the the client application is asking for an access token so what is essentially telling the OAuth provider i need an access token that you need to send me somebody is asking so the endpoints are mostly standardized which is good for attackers at the kind of brute force the endpoints using wordless we will come to brute forcing the callback and how to manipulate callback uh, later on because the redirect URI, if it is not well protect, uh, protected, it can be manipulated by an attacker and, and, and an attacker can make the data sent back to his own system if he can change the redirect URI and there is no verification. So we will come to that uh, later on during the webinar. So we have the token. The token is the actual uh, the 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 uh, the secret that will give the application, the client application, access to the confidential data, to the user's data that is stored. So, I'm asking for a token. The scope now, and this is also another important thing, and it is 
uh, it is a door to potential fraud over here. The scope is the client application is telling the OAuth provider, I need access to these items, to the open ID, which is the ID or the email address and the profile of that user. And then finally, the state parameter, this helps, it's a random number, it's a unique, it's unguessable, and it has to be tied to the particular user, meaning each user um, I can verify or the client application or the OAuth provider can verify if this state is not associated with the particular user who is doing the transaction. And it has to remain the same in the entire uh, transaction between the client application and the OAuth provider and the change uniquely for every transaction and this is optional this is one of the uh, one of the key uh, key potential areas of vulnerabilities that it is optional and if it is omitted then it opens the, the door to a csrf uh, like type attack so this is a random number and it has to be mirrored back by the response so Client ID, redirect URI, response type, scope, and the state. These are important parameters. And the request is sent via the redire redirect message, or it could be a hyperlink, as we will see. After this first step, the second now, once the OAuth provider receives this request, is going to redirect the user to a login page and it will ask the user to to uh, it will ask the user to insert his username and password okay this could be your google account for example email and password or facebook account the login here the credential is not being transferred to the client application it happens only between you and the browser between the browser and the oauth provider once you authenticate and you have provided correctly the username and password is going to ask you for a consent. It's going to tell you, listen, that the client application would like to access your profile or contact list or or so and so of your data. Do you want to allow that client application to access this information? And if, if you click yes, you move to the third place. If you click no, then the transaction is aborted and the client application will not have access to that information. So once you consent, once you say yes uh, to that question, now the third, uh, the third transaction or the third packet is going to be an access token grant. So the OAuth provider is going to is issue an access token now. Uh, and this access token is the key to heaven. If it is stolen, if it is lost, if somebody gets access to it, he had the potentiality of accessing your data on the OAuth provider. So the access token now is being sent to the client application again through the browser over here. And how does it send it? And to where does it send it? Remember, the callback was already predefined in the redirect URI. So it has to be sent to the redirect URI that is explicitly defined in the previous on uh, the first packet. And then it gives it the access token. This is the access, the access token and is very, very important and should be secret. And then it will give it, it will tell the token type and bearer is always the token type that is associated with OAuth. So if you remember in HTTP, we have different type of authentication. We have the basic, the digest, the bearer, is something we call API access based on token or a token access. So an OAT is always going to be better. And then an expiration. So this token is valid for 5,000 seconds. It could be 3,600 if it is one hour. So this number is in seconds. And then the scope is telling that this access token is valid to access the ID and the profile only, which was the scope that was in the initial request and the scope that was uh, consented to by the user. And then the state has to mirror the initial state. So this is exactly the same uh, unguessable random number that was sent initially to the client application. 
Now, the client application must verify the state number and it has to match the state in the authorization request. If there is a mismatch, that means somebody has played with the packets. And if the state parameter is not enforced and it is not used, it opens the door to some vulnerabilities and some attacks, which we are going to see in, the, in some labs. So the access token is sent via the browser, and this is a major flaw as well, because anybody uh, who has access to the browser, if the browser is compromised by some ways, then the access token is being revealed over here. After that, once the client application has the token now, it's going to issue what we call an API call. So it goes on now, it sends a packet, okay, through the browser again, through a redirect, and then the browser sends it through a get to, um, to an API call that is usually uh, the place where the resources or the user's data is stored in. This could be user info, it could be slash contact, could be slash profile, whatever that is. And it has to insert in the get request the access token as an authorization bearer type. So once this is received by the OAuth provider, it has to verify the access token, it has to link it to the scope, it has to know where it is coming from, who issued it, and what the scope is being requested. And then if everything is fine, it then responds with the resource. Okay, it responds with the resource in the form of uh, a post packet that is sent to the client application that contains the username, the email, or whatever data that is being requested. Sometimes um, step four and five, are being issued through JavaScript. So if there is a JavaScript that is sent from the client, that JavaScript issues the API call, and then that JavaScript, once it receives the response and the data, it's going to send a post request with the data as we're going to see in the lab. So there is a JavaScript coming from the application, client application at this, at this moment, and then it sends the request, the get request, get the data, send a post request with the data to the client application. As you can see here, in this type of OAuth implementation that is called implicit grant, everything passes through the browser. There is never a direct communication between a client application and the OAuth provider. That means even though traffic between the client and the browser is encrypted, Ultimately, it has to be decrypted on the browser, re-encrypted again, and then gone to the OAuth provider. And this opens a door for those secrets, especially the access token, to being revealed or exposed through the browser. So any compromise to the browser, it means the hacker got access to the access token. Not only the access token, but even the API call, the resources, and so on. So they improved the implicit type now, and it's also called implicit because the client implicitly trusts the OAuth provider. Like even though the, the client application is not talking to it directly or explicitly, it is implicitly communicating and trusting it through the user agent. So in order to enhance this flow, they developed a new one, and that is called the authorization code. It adds some extra layer on top of the implicit grant type, and we will see how. And there is also a direct communication between the client application and the OAuth provider in, the, in this second implementation. So let us look at the second implementation now, which is authorization code grant type. And the authorization um, code grant type, which is the second one, it starts exactly at the first one initially. So there is authorization request from the client application redirected through the browser or via the browser to the OAuth provider. And we can notice the client ID is the same, the redirect URI is the same, which is the call back at the client application. However, the response type here is not gonna be token. 
So the client application is not asking for a token. It is asking for a code. And there is a difference between code and token in the OAuth framework. A token is what allows you to access the resource ultimately. A code is simply uh, a way to say that you are eligible to get a code, uh, to get a token. So and instead of getting a token directly in, in this model, you get a code and then later on you exchange the code for a token. So initially you get only a code and the code has only a single purpose, which is to give you an access token later on. We're going to see how this happens. So I am asking for a code here. The client application is asking for a code and then specifying the scope, which is again the ID and the profile. And then there is a state parameter, which is again, we said it's unguessable, unique, something that should be tied to the user agent. And again, this is optional. If it is omitted, it opens the door for some uh, some vulnerabilities and attacks. So the only difference we notice is the code here instead of the token. The response now, sorry, before the response, there is again user login and consent, exactly like what happened in the on the implicit flow. You get uh, that form access through Google account or LinkedIn account, and then after that, it says. Okay, client application would like to access uh, your contact, your details. Uh, would you like to allow it? You say yes, you move on to the third step. The third step now, and instead of returning with an access token, you return an authorization code. Okay, so the response now goes to the callback through the browser to the callback. And instead of a token, we have a code and then the state. The state must match, we said, and then we have the token. The token goes all the way to the, uh, the, the code goes all the way to the client application. And now it has to do something with the code. Okay. Remember authorization code, this code is not used to access the resources. Okay. It is only uh, a key to exchange it for a token. Now, here comes the difference now, the real difference between the authorization code type and the implicit type is after getting the authorization code, the client applic application connects now directly to the OAuth provider. Okay, connects directly. And this connection is called ba back channel, back channel. And it's called back channel because it happens independently of the user agent and independently of the uh, of the browser. So it's a direct end-to-end, -end, uh, encrypted end-to-end -end between the client application and the OAuth provider. And it sends the, the, uh, the, uh, the code. You can see the code here, okay? It sends the code in exchange for access token. So it, this is requesting an access token now. And if we look at the parameter, we have a client ID, the same client initial client ID. And then we have an additional security parameter here, which is a client secret. This is it's like the client application is now doing an extra authentication of itself on the OAuth provider. This is, doesn't happen on the implicit flow. And then it gives another redirect URI Okay, so we had a redirect URI in the beginning where we got the code. Now we send another uh, redirect URI to get um, to get the access token. And we will see in a while if these two are not compared, if these two do not match the, or, or, the, or the OS provider does not compare the second one to the first one. And if it is different, then it opens the door to some vulnerabilities. And okay, the grant type authorization code, and here is the code. So this is in the back channel, and it's independent of the browser. The OAuth now, OAuth provider responds with an access token. If it verifies the code, verifies the secret, blah, 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 it gives the access token um, in a post request, or, or, or sorry, in, in, in a response, the access token, this is the access token, 
the type is better it's going to be always better the expiration and then the scope again this happens on the back channel it makes perfect sense there is no communication through the browser anymore after that there is an api call now it says okay i connect to the resource place and here is my token my access token i would like to access the user info that was provided on the on the scope earlier on and then the resource grant the OAuth provider will say okay here is the info you have asked for which the user has consented for and this is the username and the email or whatever other data uh, the user has consented to these are the two main implementations and as we have seen, the first one is simpler and yet it's less secure and more vulnerable. The second one is more secure, but more complex and requires extra, uh, extra development on the client application. And both has some vulnerabilities, which we will look at in a while, including the authorization code. So it is time now to move into the vulnerabilities. But before I move into the vulnerabilities, let me ask you if any one of you has any question on the two types so far on the implicit grant type or in the authorization code grant type so in case of implicit grant type Walid is asking, there is a chance for setting up a root server. We will see how in the implicit grant type, yes, you can set up as a hacker, you can set up your own, even your own application, client application and trick user to access it and then do some nasty things on their account um, if the OAuth provider doesn't do proper check. So yes, you can set up your own rouge malicious uh, client application that works in the implicit grant type true any more question and we will see this by the way in one of those vulnerabilities awesome so let us move on now to the vulnerabilities we will tackle now there are what I'm listing here are like five vulnerabilities. We will discuss four of them in this webinar, but there are even others which are minor. You can even search for them on the internet. I'm gonna provide you with resources later on uh, so you can read for other vulner about, about other vulnerabilities. So Ammar is asking, how would these models be secured against man in the middle type of attacks? We will look into the countermeasures at the end of uh, this webinar after we, we discuss the vulnerabilities, what the application developers need to do and what the OAuth providers need to do in order to secure against those attacks. So we have two vulnerabilities that are client side or client application related. And the first one is when we use implicit grant type for authentication remember OAuth was intended for authorization not for authentication however what happens is if i go back to the implicit here and then at the last stage at the last stage if the client application let's say you are a developer and you, you are the developer of this client application if you get uh if you get resource grant if you get the username and email you would know that this user Carlos has authenticated to the uh, Google or Facebook. And then that means since he, he has authenticated, you can uh, log, him, uh, log him in. So you can use this form of authorization as a way to authenticate users, even though it is not intended as such. However, uh, some client application utilize or use the OAuth for authentication in the implicit grant type. And if it is not properly implemented, 
especially if it is lacking an additional layer we call uh, connect ID, uh, sorry, uh, open ID connect, then there is a potential vulnerability over here and we will demonstrate it in a while. So if, if implicit is, is used with authentication improperly, then we have a vulnerability. This is the first vulnerability on the client. The second one is if the state parameter is not checked or omitted, then there is a potential uh, CSERF type attack that can happen uh, on the client application. On the server side, the authorization code and the access to and the access tokens can be leaked and can be exposed externally. And the scope can sometimes be improperly validated and the attacker can change the scope. So you say yes to contacts only, but then the attacker expands contacts and let's say images, and then he will, ha he will have access to things which you have not consented for. And then finally, there is um, unverified user registration as a vulnerability but I, I but I don't think we will have time to cover it in this webinar. Let us start with the first one, which is improper authentication. So the implicit grant type, we know that the access token is being sent via the, the browser, okay? And once the client application receives the resources it has asked for, it basically authenticates the user based on the access token it has received, okay? And remember, the access token that it has received, the client application has no way of associating it with a particular user account. So it's only implicitly trusting that this access token really, really belongs to the user who claims to be. So if a hacker who is sitting here can manipulate the, the final message or the message that contains the access token and associate this access token with another email address or another user account, he might have access to that other user account. Okay? And let us do the first lab, which demonstrate this vulnerability. I hope you guys have registered online. So if you have registered and would like to follow with us, you go to the OAuth authentication. This is the first lab over here. I'm going to go to my VM. No proxy. So the labs on port swigger and the good things about them is they have a solution. So each lab has a solution which you can follow through, okay? But I'm gonna do them my own way. Uh, they use here Burpee Suite. You can use Burpee Suite, but I'm gonna use Zap Proxy, okay? And I'm gonna explain each step as we move along, okay? So what we have here, let us access the lab. We have a blog website. So we have a blog website over here, okay? This is a blog website. And there is something called login with social media. So you are logging in using your own social media account. And in the description, you have your social media account, Wiener and password is Peter. And we have to compromise Carlos account. So we have to access as Wiener However, later on, we need to compromise Carlos' account, okay, in order to solve this lab. So, before I do, before I access using login social media, I'm gonna uh, hook up my Zap proxy, okay, 
by setting a proxy over here so that traffic would pass through the proxy okay and we will intercept the uh, the requests and responses and see the interaction as it goes along so log in with social media okay since it's https i need to accept the zap certificate okay and simply i'm gonna access with wiener and password peter so it says we like to block is requesting access to profile email we say continue now we are authenticating through the OAuth provider and now my account as you can see here winner account okay we need to access Carlos account so let's go to the zap here and see what happens what happens was the first thing when I clicked login with my social media, I was immediately taken to the OAuth provider. This is the URL of the OAuth provider. I went to the OAuth API endpoint. This is the client ID of the blog website. The redirect URI is over here. This is the blog website. Okay, it is different than uh, than the uh, the authorization website, the OAuth provider website and the the callback or the redirect is oauth callback okay which means whether the token or the code needs to be sent over there the response type is token since it is token i know immediately this is the implicit grant type and then we have a nonce the nonce is is acting like the state over here okay this is the state parameter it could be state or a nonce and then the scope open id profile and email okay the response was okay you want to access that you have to log in we logged in using our username and password on the social on the on the social media platform this is has nothing to do with the blog platform and then i need to consent this is my consent when i send the confirmation that i have confirmed to the scope and then after I have given my consent, I am redirected back to the OAuth callback, okay? I am redirected to the OAuth callback and in the URL, if you notice previously in the response, that in the callback, you can see the access token is being given right over here. This is the access token, my own access token and we have the expiration and the token type and the scope okay so using this information alone that is sent to the oas to the uh, oas callback what it does now it needs to send an api request to access the resource okay the api request is gone to the dot uh, the slash me so over here you have get this is the authorization the oauth provider slash me okay i am here trying to access my own uh trying to access the user data and the authorization bearer you can see the access token that was sent earlier okay and then the the OAuth provider will respond to the callback URI, which is the authenticate in this case, and it will give the information that is requested. Email Wiener, username Wiener, and then the token. Now, this is sent from the browser, of course, from the OAuth provider through the browser back to the blog website, okay? Now, if I manage to hijack this packet and change the email address from my email address to Carlos' email address, guess what is going to happen? I'm going to access, I'm going to access Carlos' email using the token that I have generated for myself because there is no way for the blog website to actually associate this token 
with Wiener account. Okay, it's simply trusting whatever that is coming along this post packet. So, and then continue, continue, continue. And the rest is to show the website. I want to show you even something here further, which is uh, the way when when we send the get request to the OAuth callback, the OAuth callback gave us a script. Okay, and this script does two things. It does uh it it does the api call this is the api call over here so it connects to the oas provider at slash me it sends the authorization bearer token and then once it receives the information or the user data containing the username and the email it connects back to the slash authenticate and then it will append whatever data that was received so this is the authorization that is sent by the JavaScript. And this is the authenticate, which is sent again by the JavaScript. The first one was directed to the OAuth provider. The second was directed to the, uh, to the client application, which is the blog website. Now, since we know this is vulnerable, since we know that the, the authentication happens using the implicit flow, okay? And there is no proper mechanism of checking the email address associated with, with that access token. Let us now repeat the whole process and try to intercept the packets and let's see if we can change the email address here and see what will happen. So on that proxy, you can set up, um, something we call breakpoints and breakpoints allows you to uh, to break at each request and response and modify it accordingly so login with social media and this is the packet as it's going to the OAuth provider I will let it pass and then the response comes and the response now needs to connect back to the to the callback I will let it go there is no harm in that and now i have the connection to the callback i will let it go remember i need to intercept the post request now this is the response containing the javascript it does two things the first one is going to be now to send uh, a get request with authorization bearer Next, remember, this is a new token, which I have generated now for myself, for my login, okay? Which ultimately I'm going to associate it with Carlos' email address. Next. Now, this is the response coming from the server. I do not need to change it now because I need to intercept the one that is after it. This is the one that I need to intercept. This is the post request now that is sent back to the blog website containing the token associated with the user information, email and username. Remember, since there is no validation and there is no way to actually verify the user data is who the user data is or who the user is, um, then I can simply associate this token with any email address I want. So if I go to the lab over here and I need to, to log in as Carlos account. So if I copy Carlos email address and paste it over here instead of my email address, I paste and then forward the packet all the way to the end. And let me see if I access. Okay, it says congratulations, you solved it. My account is now Carlos account. So I managed to access Carlos account using my using an access token that was supposedly generated for me. Any question on this lab? 
So the mistake here that was done is first it is implicit flow, which means access token is being revealed to the browser and I can access it. And the second thing, it is used for authentication. That means it is implicitly trusted and I can link or associate this token to any uh, email address or user identity that I like. Clear so far? Awesome. Let's move on to, to another type of attack, which is flawed CSERF protection. Now, this is very simple thing. If you are familiar with CSARF attack, the CSARF attack happens when a hacker tricks a victim into sending a query, sending an HTTP request, whether it is GET or POST, through their own browser to do something with that request without the victim knowing that they are sending that request. So, and when I send that request through their own browser, of course, the browser is going to use their cookies, blah, blah, blah. So, which means they're going to do what I want on their own account without them knowing they are doing that, uh, that activity. To protect against uh, CSERF, usually there is like a, a token or a code that is inserted for every transaction and it is uniquely generated and and for me as an attacker if i cannot guess that that nonce then i cannot perform the attack anymore the state parameter is really meant to act as a CSERF protection so if it is omitted if it is not used or if it is not properly checked or validated that means I can trick users, okay, into sending, uh, into doing an action that they do not want to do, okay, into doing an action that they do not want to do, and that action will actually harm them and benefit the attacker. So we have a lab also. Let's go through this lab. This is the second lab on our list. It is called forced OAuth profile linking. So I'm going to access the URL, go to my lab machine over here. I'm going to close the first one, unlink the proxy. <coughs> this is the second lab. OK, I'm going to access the lab over here. So to solve this lab, I need to do a CSRF attack and attach my own social media profile to the administrator account. And once I become administrator, I need to delete Carlos. Okay. So let's see how we can do that. This is the blog. Let us again go through the proxy, the Zap proxy. Let's start with a free session, with a new session. So, first of all, it tells me to access uh, the website using my own credentials. So, I'm going to log in normally now. This is not OAuth. This is a normal login, okay, on the blog application. And on my account over here, it's telling me that I have the option to attach a social media profile. So I can attach, for example, my Google profile or Facebook profile to this blog, okay, so that later on, when I access through um, 
through my social media, I get access to my own winner account directly. So I can either access it through my profile or through social media profile or through the typical username and password. So let me associate it over here. And I need another set of username and password, which is given here. Sign in. Continue. And I have linked my social media account to my winner account. In this case, if I access using social media account and go to my account, I will find I am logged in as winner again. So it doesn't matter now which way I access my account. I have linked my social media to my normal account. Now, if we look at the proxy here, we will see some interesting items, okay? First of all, this is the, the typical login that happens, okay? I'm trying to access it. I have given my username and password, okay? And then I said, when I said, I want to link now my social media. I was redirected to the authorization to the OAuth provider. Okay. And as you can see here, this is the authorization, the OAuth provider. I have the client ID as usual. The redirect, which is the, the callback URI, is back to the OAuth linking. Okay. So the reply is going to the OAuth linking. The response type is code. So this is authorization code. It is not uh, implicit code. And then we have a scope. Notice here that there is no state parameter. And since there is no state parameter, okay, that means the response, okay, does not have also a state parameter, which means I can send a fake response later on and the the blog website will have no idea that my fake response actually is fake okay so and then of course it asked me to log in now using my social media so I access my social media and I have to confirm this is my consent consent to the scope I consented okay and then I am back here. You can see this is the get back to the OAuth linking and I do have now a code. Okay, now I do have a code. Now this code is my own social media account. Okay, it is for my own social media account and it is going to link my social media account with the account that is open right now with this session cookie. So what if I generate a code for my own social media account and then I trick the administrator to send that get request from his own browser, what's gonna do now? What's gonna do is it's gonna associate my own social media account with the administrator account. And this is possible because there is no state parameter. If there was a state parameter, it would be very hard to guess what is the state parameter at that particular time that is, that is issued by the, uh, by the blog website. But, but since the, the blog website is not using a state parameter, then this opens the door to a potential CSRF attack. Okay. Let us see how this can be done, how this type of attack can be done. If you notice on the lab website, there is an exploit server. So basically it tells you there is an exploit server over here. And this is in the description. 
the admin user will open anything you send them from the exploit server okay and they have uh, an active session always this is the exploit server okay and this url is this url so this is a, an attack called server okay uh under slash exploit you're gonna type your own body whatever exploit you will have send that url to the admin okay using this button deliver exploit to the victim and according to the lab setup the admin will always click on that link and once he clicks on that link the body is going to execute whatever malicious code you have had and what we want to do now is we want to let the browser of the administrator send exactly this get packet okay send exactly this get packet with a new of course with a new code and by doing that we will associate our own social media profile with the administrator account so let me go back to the lab log out okay now let me log in with my normal account my account and let me do another round of attaching a social profile however this time is going to be with a breakpoint all i need to do now is to generate a new code and before it is being used i need to send it to the to the administrator to the victim so attach a social profile this is typical so send this authorization request to the oauth provider we get a response the response goes to the oauth linking back we don't do anything with the response and when i see a get this is now the url that will attach my own social media platform with my own account now this code is a fresh and a new it hasn't been used yet and all i want to do is to trick the attacker uh, sorry to trick the victim to execute it from his own browser once it is executed from his own browser it's going to associate my own account which is linked by this code to the administrator account so i need to copy now this url and i need to drop this entire transaction now because if it goes to the to the blog website then the code is no longer valid so drop 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 okay once it is dropped i do not need to send it through the url i am back i am back here okay i need to log out and i need to trick now the administrator to execute this one simple way to force uh, the client to force your victim to send any any URL is is to embed your URL in an image tag so and instead of pointing to a real image you simply put your own link over here okay and then once he opens it once he opens this page okay the web browser is going to execute this URL automatically automatically once it is executed um game is over so i need to save it first deliver it to the victim now supposedly the admin is clicking on that url okay the image is loading the image is gonna connect to that url 
which contains a new authorization code. And this authorization code is associated with my own social media, social media platform because I have generated myself. And it's gonna associate my social media platform with the administrator website. So if I access now with social media, okay, now I find myself as an admin and as requested by the lab, I need to delete Carlos. I can delete even whatever. And if you delete Carlos, you solve the lab as per the instructions over here. So what we did here, because there is a lack of a state parameter, I generated a new code associated with my own social media platform. And then I, I tricked the administrator to issue that URL so that my, account, my social media account is associated with the administrator. Any questions so far on this second lab? Okay. I can move on now with the third vulnerability, okay, which is on the on the server side and it is the the greatest vulnerability in OAuth and it is the the most famous vulnerability on OAuth. And this vulnerability is the possibility of leaking, externally leaking, the code or the access token. Okay, externally leaking the code or the access token. And this can be whether in the implicit grant or it can even be in the authorization code grant. It doesn't really matter. Okay. But if you get hold of the token, that means you can access the the user data, okay? The user data. You can do a lot of bunch of things, okay? And even if there is no authentication with it, you might not, for example, access the account, but you can access the data. You can pull the data, okay? So remember, in the implicit flow, the access token is passed directly through the browser, okay? So the browser gets to see it, the access token. But on the authorization code, on the authorization code, the code is transferred through the browser, okay? However, the, the access token is being exchanged offline or in the back channel later on. Regardless, regardless, if I managed to hijack the redirect URI, somebody talked about the redirect URI, the, the callback endpoint before. If I managed to hijack it, okay, if I managed to hijack it, if I can insert my own URL, guess what? Then the access token or the code is going to be sent to my own system, okay? Now, this can happen in, in different ways. It can happen either in the authorization code, it can even happen in the implicit code. In the implicit code, it's simpler. So maybe I will check the implicit code first, and then we come to the, um, to the authorization code. So in the implicit code, okay, if in the authorization request, I manage to hijack the callback endpoint and insert my own URI, okay, I will get the token directly delivered to me, okay? I will get the token directly delivered to me. The solution is always here for the OWASP provider to validate the callback endpoint. 
and how does it do that it turns out whenever the client application registers initially at the OAuth provider in the beginning okay in the beginning whenever it registers in the beginning it has to do to provide a white listed uh, URIs to be used as callback endpoints okay if this is not the case if there is no explicit whitelist URI then that means a hacker can hijack the callback and then tokens will be delivered to his own system the problem is even if there's a whitelist that is on the OWASP server sometimes the validation is not proper okay and we will talk about how sometimes validation if it is not properly validated or compared there is a major issue over here in the authorization code things is a little bit complicated first the the attacker can hijack the callback the initial callback but this in this case he will not get the code he will get sorry he will not get the token he will get the authorization code the authorization code is useless by itself he cannot exchange it for a token because he is not the client id and he doesn't know the secret but what the attacker now will do after getting the code he will talk to the client application and send the code so that the client application now would exchange the code for a token okay will exchange the code the the, uh, the the code for a token and assumes that he is now the the client the 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 way to solve this the way the OAuth provider uh, the way to ensure that there is no compromise here is for the OAuth provider to check that the second callback where the access token is sent is exactly the same callback where the code was was sent so if the code was sent to a system and then the access token is sent to another system there is a problem okay there's the two have to match and this is uh this is the solution to it now as i said the problem is always in how to check for for matches how how to make the comparison okay and it turns out the way to validate can be flawed okay so even though even though it might not allow the uh, the the code to be leaked externally it might allow the code to be leaked to internally to another page for example if this url here is being whitelisted okay and then somebody passes this uri okay slash two dot slash blog then the oas provider if he only checks the first part of it he might allow the second uri to be passed okay and this is a form of improper validation improper validation now you might ask yourself okay since i have changed only a portion of the uri and have it changed everything this does not reveal or leak the access token or the code to the attacker because the attacker still he 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 does not have access to the client application and he could not insert his own url he he could not insert his own system domain over here to get the access token so in here it gets quite complicated but if we find a vulnerability on that second page okay and that vulnerability can allow us to externalize the token then i can send the token and instead to this one i can send it to the blog and then from the blog it can be externalized to the to the attacker side
So Walid is asking this question in the implicit grant type. What I meant is that the client is not checking whether the OS provider is legitimate or not. So if a client computer is compromised and the OS provider's domain name was changed through the host file to point to hacker on OS server, would that scenario be feasible? A worst case would be to modify. Okay, your question is that the hacker forges his own OS provider. Okay, now this does this has really low impact for a single reason. This really is 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 not the purpose of the attack because what the attacker wants ultimately is to get access to the user data on the original OAuth provider. So let's say the original OAuth provider is Facebook and it contains data about you, okay? If you fake your own OAuth provider, okay? And then let's say the victim is trying to access a website, let's say Robtex website that requires authentication through Facebook. And then you manage to hijack that so that now he is accessing through your own OAuth provider, ultimately, yes, you might get access to username and password, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, you did not access the, the actual data on the, on, the Facebook, on the Facebook website of the user. Now, even if, if you get his username and password of Facebook, this is not an attack against OAuth, okay? This is a social engineering attack where you faked your own uh, login page that resembles Facebook and you compromise his account. This is still a major attack, okay? You got his access, but this is not an attack against OAuth framework, okay? It's a social engineering with a domain, uh, with like setting up a fake domain, okay? Similar to Facebook. But we are interested here in OAuth vulnerability itself, vulnerabilities in the implementation of OAuth framework. Okay, hope that answers your question. So, so if you find a second vulnerability on the on that page, on the blog page, okay, and then we redirect the access token to that page, and that access that page has a vulnerability which we can exploit, we can then externalize the access token to us. Examples of vulnerability that secondary vulnerability could be like that second page has a JavaScript, okay, that handles query parameter. One uh, query parameter can be access token, and then we can manipulate that to send the access token externally or cross-site scripting, HTML injection, anything that allows us to externalize the token sent to that page. And this is exactly the um, the lab we're gonna do right now, okay? Which allows us to external to externalize the access token. <clears throat> so the lab we're gonna do is stealing OAuth access tokens via a proxy page. It's one of the hard labs on port swigger this is the access this is the lab Okay, so let us proxy through Zap right now. Okay.
the proxy page. Okay, it's an expert level lab. And the solution is right here. Okay. We will go through it and study some important aspects of it. Okay. New session to start fresh. And let's see now, navigate this lab. Okay, we've got the blog login with social media. So let us attempt to log in with social media. Okay. What credentials am I giving? Wiener Peter. Sign in. Save. The blog is requesting access to profile email. Continue. I confirm. And I have my account over here. This is the exploit server. We have an exploit server over here, which means we can deliver an attack to the, uh, to the victim, okay, as requested. What is asking us to solve the lab, identify a secondary vulnerability in the client application, and use this as a proxy to steal an access token for the admin user's account. Use the access token to obtain the admin's API key and submit the solution using the button provided. We submit the solution through this button. Okay, let us check here. So the first thing is when we access through our social media, we notice that we went to the auth, okay? We have the client ID, the redirect URI, okay? Goes back to the OAuth callback response type is token so i'm asking for a token and there is a nonce so the, the nonce is exactly like the state that means the second vulnerability we have explored together cannot be done and then this is the scope okay and then of course i logged in i confirmed and then i go back to the oath callback and then as usual, you authorize with this code. And then once you once you authorize, you send back the info. Now, we cannot really now play with the email. Remember, because we have the state parameter. So I cannot really now uh, instruct, uh, instruct the victim uh, or, or I cannot really uh, spoof the email address now. Um, now, what I want you guys to to do is let us manipulate the OAuth callback. Now, since the OAuth callback, if you notice here um, in the response, this URL receives the access token, okay? And let's see if we can externalize this access token to a domain we can control, okay? Let us see if this is doable, okay? Let's see if this is doable. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna log out, set up a breakpoint, log in with social media, and now here in the get request, 
let me see if I can change the re redirect URI to something else. Okay. So let me go to www. Just I'm going to enter a random website, google.com, just to see whether the OWASP provider really verifies the redirect URI. Does it have a whitelist? Doesn't compare the redirect URI to the legitimate URI that's supposed to be there. Because if there is no comparison, that means I can put my own website over here and then I'm going to get the access token. Okay. So let us send it and see what happens. We got an error. Oops, something went wrong. Redirect URI mismatch error description. Redirect URI did not match any of the clients registered redirect URIs. That means the client, which is the web server, okay, which is the block server, sorry, has already a list of approved redirect URIs. And the access token must be sent to one of those URIs. Now, we are not sure how strong the validation at the OAuth provider is. Is it really strong? Does it really validate the redirect URI properly? Let us check. Let us do another attempt now. So let us set another breakpoint and log in with social media. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do directory traversal. Directory traversal. So this is the redirect URI. This is whitelisted. Okay. This is in the list at the OAuth provider, and it is provided by the client application initially. So I'm going to do forward slash two dot forward slash, and then I'm going to enter like um, a legitimate website, uh, a legitimate page. So let us check, like, let me go to view post. Now, of course, this is, now we have a page here, post six. Okay, so I'm going to copy it. Close it. And insert this one here. Okay. Now, all I'm doing is I'm sending the access token back to a post simply just to see if, it, if this trick works or not, just to see if there is a proper validation or not. Submit everything. And it seems there is no error. All I got is, yes, there is no login because, of course, um, the access token was not sent properly, but ultimately, if you notice here, the access token like was sent to the access token indeed was sent to to the post ID six. Okay. So even though there is a whitelist, the comparison is not exact. So I can send the access token to other pages on the same domain. Now, if I can find another vulnerability on those domains, that means I can externalize the token to my own website. Let's see if there is another vulnerability. And apparently, yes, there is another vulnerability. So if we access um like a post like this post okay we see a comment over here let me send the comment so nice article for example name abid samhuri email whatever for example at hotmail and website http google.com Okay, post a comment. Okay, I submitted here a comment. And if I go here, 
what I see is the comment. This is the comment. It was sent to comment over here. Okay. So what if, and there is a confirmation, what if I can send the, the access token as a comment, okay? What if I can send it as a comment? And if this comment is vulnerable, I can externalize to, to an external domain. Now, if we investigate this, this form, view page source, and we go to the comment section, we'll find that it is loaded as an iframe Okay, and we have a page post comment comment four, and if we access it, we find this little piece of code. Now, if we check this, we will find there are two post message functions. There is a parent dot post message function, and then we have a parent post message fun function, and this really means that whatever comment I insert, okay, is going to be handled using the post message function, and then it is sent back to the server. So the JavaScript will read my comment and then send it back to the server. Now I want you to notice something here. If I go to the post message explanation, what does it really mean? This is the post message, okay? It has a certain syntax, okay? The post message, message it takes the message that I want to send, and then the target origin, where do I want to send it to, okay? Where do I want to send it to? And the target origin specifies what the origin of target window must be for the event dispatch, okay? If it is star, indicates no pre no preference which means if it is star that means ultimately that data is not restricted to go anywhere it's not restricted so it means it can go anywhere and this is by itself a vulnerability because if you are talking about normal comments sending it anywhere really doesn't make any sense however since i am now redirecting my access token to that form, okay? That means that form with an, with an addition of another JavaScript, I can externalize whatever comment, which is the access token, and externalize it somewhere else, okay? And all I need to do now is Make the callback, make the callback, this forum, this form, the comment form, okay? So I'm going to copy this one over here, okay? And then the callback will be, this is the callback. This is the URL callback. So... This is the get request. I'm going to copy this entire get request over here. So let me check. Let us go the solution. Apparently, we need to open so, uh, the the exploit server, okay, and initiate an iframe, okay. So if, if you notice here in the solution, I need to set up an iframe with the source, and this is the URL that is exactly the one we have seen on the Zap proxy, okay, which is that include the client ID, it includes the redirect URI, which I'm going to hijack and then to include the response type and the nonce. So, 
I'm going to do a new one now, new initiation. So stop it here. Login with social media. Okay, and I have this URL. I need to copy it. And I'm going to now insert it on the server as an iframe. Now, what's going to happen here if the if the victim opens this one, okay, the callback is going to initiate a new authorization request to the server with his own account, okay. However, the callback is going to be linked to, now I, I need, of course, to change this one to point to post and the post which is comment form over here copy that means the authorization code is going to be sent or the access token is going to be sent back to this uh, to the form okay to the comment form and then i have a small javascript code given to me over here which really will externalize the comment back to the back to the server that means now add add event listener i'm adding an event listener and you can check the event listener over here to know what it what it does Okay, I'm setting an event listener on the type of message. So as you can see here, type message. So whenever there is a message being sent, what do I do with this message? I send the message to the, uh, to the exploit server and append the message over there. So when I access the access logs, ultimately I should see whatever message that has been posted. So if I store this one and then I view the exploit, access log, Okay, when I view it, now I have redirected an access token to the form, to the comment form, and if I access the logs, I should be able to see that the access token, a new access token was really generated for me, um, and it's being posted now to the access logs, okay? What does this mean? It means if I deliver this exploit to the victim, and he clicks on it, that means he generated an access token for his own account, okay? And then that access token now has been delivered to, to me. So this is now the access token. I can copy the access token. Now, this is, of course, not the solution. I can copy the access token. And if I go back to the Zap proxy, what I noticed was whenever I generated an access token, the access token is then sent as through the get with authorization bearer, okay? 
and the response would be some secret API key. Okay, so if I manage now to send an authorization token similar to this one, okay, similar to this one, if I send now this one with my own authorization token, I should be able to get to get access to the API of the administrator and solve this lab. So if I insert it here and then I send and then I got the API key of the administrator. So I managed to solve it. Okay, guys, do you have any question so far? We are wrapping it up. So in five minutes, we will end this webinar. I just have a few points to mention. Any questions so far? Okay. The final, the final vulnerability that may happen on OAuth is a flawed scope validation. Now, we know that the client application has to specify a scope and it gets access token in order to access that scope only. However, an attacker, if the, if the scope is not well verified at a later stage, an attacker can upgrade this access token, this, uh, this scope and include additional items and he will have access to, uh, to additional items. So in the implicit grant type, the attacker steals the token. It has, this is a prerequisite for this attack. So he, he steals the access token and then he would send an API request now upgrading the scope. If the OAuth provider does not verify the, uh, the scope and it replies immediately back, then the attacker manages to access this additional information. The same thing can happen with the authorization code. The attacker, here the attacker registered his own client application first. He registers his own client application. He tricks the user to actually, uh, to, to access his, his, his server. And then he would be, he would be given uh, a consent confirmation. And once he consent to the actual data, the attacker now has an authorization code. He exchanged it for, a, for, for an access token. And then he will send an API call with additional uh, scope parameter. And if the OAuth provider, uh, if the OAuth provider does not validate the scope, then the hacker gets access to additional information. So last thing, the scope has to be properly validated at every transaction and it cannot be implicitly trusted. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. The, uh, we have seen how the state parameter is important. So on the OAuth provider and on the client application, both of them have to utilize the state parameter, which acts, which acts as a CSERF protect, protection and it has to be verified at all times. We have seen how redirect URIs can be forged and, uh, and changed and if fake parameters can be inserted. Uh, there has to be proper whitelisting of all callback redirect URIs and there has to be very, very strict comparison. Otherwise, manipulation of these redirect URIs can take place. And always make sure if you are a client application developer always make sure that authorization authorization codes are not leaked by any means uh, neither in the url nor in a referrer nor anywhere else okay in authorization code request you have to send the redirect uri twice one once when you issue the the code and the other when you issue the token uh, when you send the token request. That's all, guys, for today. 
if you have any question in these last minutes please type it in the chat i will be more than happy to answer it meanwhile if you would like to contact me and reach me here is my email address aws at axontechnologies.com also if you want to find the recording whether of this webinar or the previous ones here is the website for it app.livestorm.co slash axon dash technologies thank you very much guys and i look forward to seeing you in future webinars bye bye